The Book of Early Whisperings by Walter Russell Narrated by Matthew Schmitz Dedication To my beloved wife, Lau Russell my deeply inspired co-worker and collaborator in all my work, whose life with mine as one is dedicated solely to the unification of all mankind through greater knowledge of light, I lovingly dedicate this book. Walter Russell Forward. These writings are the whisperings of God's voice to me during those early periods of illumination which occurred in May of every year of my life, from the age of seven. These periods of ecstasy, which always characterized cosmic illumination, lasted from ten to fourteen days, during which time I was obliged to seek solitude and aloneness in forests. I endeavored to express the thoughts and moods of these periods of ecstasy as my varying lack of body awareness balanced with my ever-increasing cosmic God-consciousness with God and nature. Walter Russell The Awakening I breathe the air from the hills. The strength of the hills is in me. It courses through my veins. It comes to me from the mountaintops beyond the hills where the eye within me is fixed. It is light. I feel it ever coming. I take it into me. I feel the strength of the light I am taking into me. I smell the sweet odor and I drink in the sunshine. I open my lungs to the forest. I draw strength from a superpower which is light. I am that power. It is all of me. I am all of it. With my feet firmly planted to earth, I tear trees from their roots and dash them aside. It is nothing for me to tear trees from the earth, tree by tree, or forest by forest. My strength transcends that of the tree. It is mightier than that of the forest. The strength of all forests and all of the hills is in me. The earth lends me its power. The winds lend me their power. The winds of the earth are my breath. I breathe, and forests rise and fall. With the deer I run and leap, but they are motionless when I run with them. With the bird I fly, and more effectually. Sitting by the path side, I need but to think of there, and I am there, or some other where and in another breath I am back again. For the deer is a deer, and a bird is a bird. But I am a man with a soul, a man with an uncaged soul. I wander with myself in my world, my body a-wandering with my soul, companions for just a little while. Then my soul wanders alone. My body is but the house of my soul, its carriage, the roots which tie it to earth when it will be tied. It is not me, I am sure of that. I have long known that. Some day I'll write down what I know of it, and what each new moment whispers to me of it, and the silences. What the silences say of it, I will write down some day, if I ever can. Little things call my soul back from afar, little things, the curve of a sapling, the shadow of a cloud over a meadow, and the same little things send it a-wandering back again into space while my body awaits it on the path or goes to meet it absently, all unconscious of its movement, like a dead leaf on a flowing stream. The spirit of beauty balances my soul as a well of running water replenishes the earth. I seek beauty in the far spaces of my wandering and find it when thus a-wandering. 
always I find it when my weightless soul extends within the extensions of the stars and leaves the house of clay which binds it to the mountainside. Rains replenish the well as beauty replenishes my soul. Without the beauty of great out-of-doors, I feel that my body would become too parched and dry too long to be companion to my soul. There is a brook to the right. The water falls over the rock into the limpid pool. I go eagerly to see it. The water drops over in the shadow of a great rock patined with lichens, like a bronze patined by the rain. The sun peeps into the pool and some very yellow leaves capture its rays to herald it coming. The green moss is velvet, the softest of velvet. Winter green are there awaiting me, and checker ferns. Arbutus leaves cover a bit of the turf, its pink blossoms since their spring song. Pulpit jacks show me their zebra stripings modestly. The shadow of a leaf falls upon another leaf, and still another leaf silhouettes itself upon the rock. Quite unaware of me, a busy ant makes its way across the rock carrying something much larger than itself. I am as certain that I am that ant as that I am I. I carry the burden with the ant. I feel my body straining with the burden of the ant. I am alone with all this activity. Shall I turn to the right or to the left? What matters it? Even now I feel my soul parting from its anchorage of heavy clay. I see my light interwoven with the universal light. The Song of the Stream There is a stream in my world, rushing, shallow and clear, and spotted with stones. A road winds along by its side, grass grown and streaked with shadows from the trees of my world, and splashed with sun in the depths of its forest. The blue of the infinite spaces domes the road, and the stream, and the forests, and me, as I stroll by the stream in my world. The song of the stream fills the air, and my ears, and my heart, and gladdens my soul as I walk in ecstasy on the road by the stream. Its song is the song of flowing waters, soft and low and murmuring, of falling waters resounding, sonorous, of rushing waters rippling and trilling in soulful cadenzas, born in the depths of boulder-lined pools and echoed in space for the listening gods and for my attuned ears. The melody stirs my soul, the wonderful melody of the stream, the symphony of earth tones, the harmony of nature's themes played in the fluty throats of happy birds, played on the harps of the breeze and waving branches and rustling leaves, played on the resined strings of insect wings, in the piccolos of crickets, the violas of bees, the oboes of the katydids, and by the great orchestra of countless hosts of hidden things that play and sing and buzz and drone and chirp for me in my world. I hold my breath and listen. The ears of my soul open wide. My pulse beats fast and then beats slow. The melody quivers in my nerves and chills and warms and chills me again. It carries me through space to unknown worlds, then brings me back to listen again to the deep burden of the pounding waters and the accompanying diapason of tireless rushing. Stream, my stream, my waters, my world, removed for me alone beyond the tread of wingless souls who walk the earth heavily in chains. My head is high, my arms extend to the heaven. My eyes are closed, the better for my ears to hear the theme of the finch which plays itself into the symphony of the stream. I no longer walk, I float. My feet are winged, I grasp the daisy head to anchor me to the sod of my world. 
Into the symphony comes the flute of the thrush, rich, melodious. Then suddenly the oboe of the kingfisher takes the theme, shrilly, menacingly. The stream pounds its warning accompaniment in its deep pool, its whirlpools. Ominously, the kingfisher streaks up the stream, shrieking his last note in the wild theme of the rushing waters. And then, the note is drowned in a splash and a beating of wings as the stream wails its loss in its song. I open my eyes to the peaceful fluttering of the butterfly's wings, and it stills my soul. The tremulous, agitato blends in the symphony of the stream. The theme is gay and happy again. It hums and it trills as a million fairies come with the breeze, all touching a leaf with their wands as they pass along singing the song of the breeze. A red squirrel sits on a nearby bough and chatters his note in the melody and then runs away. Wildflowers nod and beat time and my ears half close as my eyes reflect the wonder of the stream and the road that winds by the stream in my world. An oak grows by the side of the road, and in its cooling shade, I pause. It reaches one arm caressingly over the stream, as though to bless it. I love you, little stream, it seems to say. You cool my roots. You give me a drink. You keep my leaves fresh and green, and you heal my bark from winter scars and you murmur to me all day and all night. I am never lonely, thirsty, nor sun-scorched because of you. Flow on, dear stream. Marvelous tree of my world, I love you. I love you as you love the stream. I love your gnarled roots, your ice scars, your massive trunk and reaching arms. I love to hear your leaves whispering to me as I pass you by. I love your knots and hospitable squirrel holes. I love your twists and elbows and joints and the sunspots which dance on your living self. O oh, friendly tree, farewell, I say as I pass it by. There is a turn in the road and a bend in the stream where the waters flow slowly, silently. Where the banks are spread, the stream bed deep and surface unspotted with stones. It is the resting place of the stream, the busy, noisy, rushing stream. Ten bars there are for the rest in the river symphony, ten bars for the deep tones, and none for the flutes which carry the song on the breeze to the shallows beyond the bend, where the stream is again spotted with stones. There is a couch for me in this resting place, a couch of moss near a lichened rock which overhangs the stream. I lie flat on my face among the panpipes and pulpit jacks and gaze into the tranquil waters. My eyes are on the moving clouds below me in the stream, great snowy clouds moving slowly across the mirror of the stream, and as I look at them, the earth beneath me rises, slowly, slowly above the waters and the forest's image in the waters, deep below. I grip the moss and fix my eyes on the receding image in my world upside down in the stream. As I ascend a league into the blue, my couch and the rock and the panpipes keep pace as I go, each feeling my grip as I hold them tight, as I cling to them, closer, closer, till we stop, stop still, poised floating in space, while the clouds drift by in the stream below and make me dizzy and faint and tremulously glad so long as I hold my eyes to the clouds below the stream. What joy to lie in the moss and float away and away, forever and ever, never to move from the lichened rock, never to come down, to be God on a mount with a world below whose destiny is mine, a world of music and color and birds and bees and flowers and hosts of other things, all mine. O oh, stream in my world, sing on. I listen, I listen. 
From my likened throne in the sky, I listen, my senses a-quiver, my ears attuned, and my eyes affixed to the clouds and the waters below. Sing on, sing on to me the song of thy waters, the wonderful song, the forever song, the never-ending, never-beginning song of thy waters. Tell me, O stream, the words of thy song, and what you are singing about, and to whom? And the stream replied, To poets and painters and lovers and men with souls, I sing my song. I sing of the pines which border my shores, of the breeze and the pines, of their fluttering needles. I sing of my loved ones, my children, the brooks, as they rush to my bosom, laughing and gay, and ride with me to the salty sea. I sing of the sea, of its brine and its promise, its glorious promise that I shall return again and again, forever and ever, in midst and in silence, return with joy to this peaceful vale to journey again to the salty sea, singing my song on my pebbly bed. I sing of the deer that plunges their tongues from their run in my cooling depths, of the herds of kine that slake their thirst and mirror themselves in my shallow bays. I sing to the night, O lover of mine, to the beautiful night, so restful and still. To the drowsy night, while the world is asleep, I chant my song, all surpliced in white, the white veil of mist, which is my garment at night and my gift to the rising sun. I sing to the sun, to the light of the sun, to the gathering storm whose thunder I echo, to the winter burden of ice, my gift to spring, to the hills, the playground of brooks, to the towering trees, to the towns I pass, and to the little children who laugh along my banks. To the moon I sing, and the joyful stars that image themselves in my quiet pools, and dance all night from shore to shore on my ripples and eddies and the tops of my waves. O oh, busy stream, sing on. In the stillness of the far hills where you were born, sing your baby song, your babbling baby song, to the accompaniment of birds and of whispering leaves. I open my heart to your childish prattle among the pebbles, where listening willows droop over your widening banks, to your song of welcome to each dependent brook, to the songs of the brooks themselves leaping their last rocks into your ever more abundant self, to the last high trembling notes as you pause in your song at the bend above the dam, where the water is still and pond lilies grow. The glory of your singing takes me with you, playing, singing, rejoicing with you through the changing valley song of youth around pebble bends, through plowed fields and fields green with rye and corn and clover, dancing with you past nodding wildflowers and beneath trees whose gnarled roots reach from under banks like yearning arms of octopi, floating with you through crevices and chasms and rock ledges where you have patiently worn your way for ages, singing cheerily as you worked. Rushing breathlessly, I ride on your agitated waters through the rapids above the falls, listening enraptured to the growing crescendo of your river symphony, listening to the wild call of your swirling waters as you gather yourself for the great plunge. Then leap, leap far into the gorge below, all clothed in white like the foam of the sea. And as you leap, I hear the note of the sea in your song. I hear the giant waves beating upon the sand. I hear the echo of the note in the hills, and the breeze in the pines sings the tone of the sea, the brooding, soulful tone of the sea. I feel the tone vibrating in my soul like the strings of a responding harp. I hear in the swishing sound of dissolving foam the soothing song of briny waters heard on the sandy shores of the sea. O little sister of the sea, impatient stream, flow on. Through canyon and gorge and chasm thy waters race, in the allegro vivace cadenza of the river symphony. 
From the falls to the sunlit valley, the theme is suspended in this one long cadenza. Then, through the mouth of the shadowy gorge, I leap with you into the beautiful valley of peace below, and through fields and meadows, I float with you, now hearing again the theme of flowing waters, of rippling waters. Far down the valley, I hear the voice of thy mother stream calling, calling her children to journey with her to the salty sea. And I hear in your song their answering note, and your call to the hills, and your valley, and me, saying to me, I shall return again and again, forever and ever, in midst and in silence, return with joy to this peaceful vale to journey again to the salty sea, singing my song on my pebbly bed. Autumn in my world. Against the blue autumnal haze of my world, a milkweed fluff wanders lazily, aimlessly. I watch it from my couch of moss on the edge of the woods, from a leaf-strewn bed of soft green moss, where my soul has bade me rest. I watch it poise on myriad silken wings, as if to view the autumn landscape, perhaps to choose the spot where it might lay its precious seed. A breath of wind, and it is gone, lost somewhere in the blue haze of my world, lost for a time to me, gone to do a milkweed's work in my world. How wonderfully beautiful is my world this Sabbath day, how reposeful, how still, how in harmony with my soul. Down the valley I hear distant chimes which summon the people of the countryside to worship. I see the white spire of the church on the green, outlined against the hills. I hear the rattle of farmers' rigs on their way to church. There are white dots moving along the distant, winding road, leading down the hill to the village green where my fellow men shall worship together in harmony and peace. It is the hour of worship and of prayer for all men. In my world, I talk with God alone, commune with Him alone. In my world's vast cathedral of tall pines, arched with green arms of pines, domed by the blue of my interminable heavens, a blue which is alone mine when I roam alone in its blue, not a blue of earth or of man's world of earth, nor even mine when I roam man's world of earth. This Sabbath day, I am alone in my highest heavens, whose cathedral walls are heaven's hills, ridge upon ridge of forested hills, hills deep dipped in the blue which is alone mine when I roam in its blue. Rhythms of soft music float down the veil of my world, rhythms of earth, mothered by heaven, attuned to the blue of high heaven, to the deep tones of the flowing stream, to the singing brooks leaping into the stream, to the rustling leaves of bobbing rows of corn, row upon row of dried cornstalk leaves, rustling in the breeze, mingling with the crisp crunching sounds of dried autumn leaves, all making music for me, the music of autumn in my world, playing for me alone, sung alone for me, by autumn's host of hidden winged things, and chanted softly by unseen angel choirs beyond the haze of blue of the far hills of my world. The very rhythm of it stirs my soul and transforms the rapture of my self-conscious thinking to the ecstasy of God's thinking and makes me one with Him. All nature bows its head in silent prayer this Sabbath morn, and I, my heart aburst with thanks for all things of my world. Pray silently. O God, I thank Thee for my inner seeing eyes, for the soul Thou gavest me, for the world that is mine because of the soul that is mine, for the hills I thank Thee, for the forests and fields and sky, for the clouds and the blue of the hills, and for Thy color I thank Thee, for the soft moss beneath me, for the rugged rock and gray tree, for the peeling bark on yonder hickory, for the red apple in the orchard below, 
for the butterflies and birds and singing creatures in grass and trees, for the stalks of corn which wave and bow and curtsy in the wind, for the sounds and noises, the chirps and trills, the buzzing and droning, the bleeding and blowing, for the breezes I thank thee, for their music in the trees, and for the golden leaves they carry across the curtain of my world. I lift my eyes, and I look across the valley to the hills, my majestic hills patched with forest, with carmine, gold, and cadmium forest, with plowed fields and meadows and pastures, all merging together in autumn's violet blue, all bathed in the haze of autumn's violet blue. There are farms on the hills, farms with fields bared by the harvest, fields stacked with corn, rye-seeded, cattle-dotted, well-divided fields all spread out in violet-blue haze like states on a child's map, each a different color, but all veiled in the interminable veil of autumn's violet-blue. The wind stirs the treetops of all the hills and makes of them troops of gaily uniformed soldiers that march. Yea, they run as they march, to the very tops of the hills and over each ridge. Where are they going? Why such a hurry? What is happening on the other side of the hills? Why so many little cloud puffs over the hills? Can that be the smoke of battle? Is all nature fighting a battle, a battle of the seasons? Perhaps green summer is loath to leave earth to red-blue autumn, and perhaps autumn desires its throne before its time. There surely is a battle raging over the hill. The Sabbath day, my world's a battlefield, nature's gloriously beautiful battlefield. Up the hills and over the ridge, troops are rushing, regiments of oak and hickory, regiments of pine and fir, rushing pell-mell to the hilltop, rushing to the battle on the other side of the ridge. Uniforms, resplendent in red and gold and yellow, sabers flashing, bayonets bristling, as wave upon wave of red, green, and gold soldiers are lost as they merge into the little white cloud puffs just over the ridge. Now comes the cavalry, galloping, galloping, urged on by cedar sentinels waving their arms and pointing the way, ever pointing the way to the cannonading over the ridge. Tis a wild march, a rout, a rush for the top and over the ridge, platoons of them bending and waving their arms in the wind, obeying at once the mood of the wind. And then the wind dies, dies as it borned, and the air and the hills are still again. Cedar sentinels stop in their tracks and lift their arms straight, straight into the heavens. And lo, each regiment of oak and hickory and pine and fir stands still. They rush no more to battle on the other side of the ridge. Stillness, an all-pervading stillness, a drowsy, sleepy stillness, envelops my world and me. Peace descends upon the hills to void the passions of the opposing seasons, and the peace of a Sabbath morn in a country church reaches into my hills and to me. Its stillness must have lulled me to unawareness of space and forgetfulness of time, for Sabbath morn is high noon now. The sun has climbed high overhead, unobserved by me, and the hills have disappeared by some magic, for I am now encompassed around and about by the great oaks, miles away into the next vale, which have long seemed a part of my soul. So much are they me and I them. Not so long ago I sat on this very rock and painted them. Their leaves were then green, and sunlight illumined their trunks and spots and streaks which sang glad songs, dancing to their singing, as sunlight spots always do in forest where waving branches allow rays of sun to penetrate their forest depths reluctantly, opening and closing with the aid of the winds bending sun rays to their will, permitting them within their privacy as though their world of shade were theirs to open or close, 
as the diaphragm on my camera obeys my will to command the sun, or to invite their depths as hospitable hosts, or to exclude them for reasons humans have for closing their doors to the outside world. I am wondering how I got here, or which way I came. I but dimly remember a barway and the difficulty of removing of a rail, and less dimly, I remember the passing of several deer which stopped for a moment to satisfy their curiosity as to my intrusion into their glen, but naught else do I recall of those two lapsed hours of wandering through formless space alone with my soul, listening to the silent rhythms of Earth's plannings for its winter sleep and rebirth of sleeping things in spring. I fastened my gaze to a very yellow leaf hanging alone on the topmost bough of a very tall tree, a leaf much yellower, much more golden yellow because of the blue sky in which the leaf was set like a jewel in the lapis lazuli of the heavens. And as I looked, a sudden breeze tore it away from its branch and spiraled it high over the tops of all the trees, then down again way down till another breeze carried it up again where a dazzling ray of golden sunlight illumined it as it again swirled high into the heavens, dancing, dancing, swirling, twisting, darting here and there, then floating low in the softening of the winds. My heart stood still, then beat fast again to the tempo of celestial music, its rhythm the rhythm of the swirling, dipping leaf its motif, the dancing of the leaf in the high heavens above a great forest of red and gold. Deeply inspired to ecstasy, I wept heavily at the most glorious and wondrous sight a man could ever behold and remain of earth, for such beauty surely belongs alone to the kingdom of heaven. I knew not the ending of it, nor the time of its ending except for the fact that the sun was low and no longer danced on gold-tipped leaves of forest trees. A great calm voided the storm of overwhelming bliss which exalted me unto the high heavens of my world. I found myself taking down a bar of the barway and stooping through it. I heard voices of people on their way to evening prayer in the little white church on the green. The evening star gleamed in the pale gold of the setting sun. I made my way in the direction of that star, for the path to it was my way, as the paths to all stars of God's high heavens are always my way. Emerging from the forest, I hear again the sounds of earth echoing the silences of their source in the stillness of the high heavens. I again hear the rattle of farmer's rigs. I hear the laughter of children at play in nearby fields. The tinkling of cowbells tell me it's milking time. Hours have been but moments on this glorious day in my world. How wonderful this day! How beautiful! When one's very being is vibrant with celestial harmonies. How untouched and untouchable am I while in the aftermath of nature's symphony still resounds within me. I have been alone with God. His ecstasy has been my ecstasy, his exaltation my exaltation. I shall forever be exalted, for I shall forever be alone with God, even though multitudes encompass me, even when sounds of man's world cry for response from my senses and emotions of man create whirlpools around about me. Yea, myself will not be drawn into them, for the stillness of myself will center them even as God's stillness centers the cyclonic emotions of earth. For I have been alone with God, and I am like unto Him. I have been alone in the light, and all knowing of the light is mine. Yea, I have been alone with myself, and all power of the light of self is mine. And this I know, that when I am with man, I am all men as one, even as I know that the light of me is the light of all men. This is the knowing which God whispered to me, while alone with him this autumn day in the forests of my world. O 
Ode to Eden O Bar Harbor in Eden, Fairyland of the North, I salute thee. In worshipful adoration I lift mine eyes to thy hills and bow in awe before thy majesty. I stand on thy rugged cliffs, I bear my head to the sun and the breeze. I breathe deeply thy pine-scented, salt-savored air, and the strength of thy hills is mine. I listen with the ears of my soul to the whisperings of thy pines, and the secrets of thy forests are mine. I walk thy paths, I climb thy rocks and steps. In ecstasy, I lift the cup from thy fair springs and drink, drink deep, and the life of thy waters is mine. Hand in hand with the goddess of beauty, I race thy hot sands, I leap thy red rocks, I scale thy mighty ledges where seas pound hard, I laugh, I shout, I fling my hat to the winds and bear my breast to the light, and the joy of thy sunshine is mine. I fling myself into thy blue sea and battle with its waves. Hand over hand with strokes of iron, I plow through the sea and glory in the conquest. I love the buffeting thy waters give me. I love its cold contact with my naked flesh. Green and blue, thy waves break over me, and the power of thy seas is mine. I plunge deep into thy woodland to await the twilight. Fairy time when the sprites of the woods come forth to commune with me, and the mystery of thy woods is mine. O sunny harbor of the north, take me for thine own and give thyself to me. To the goddess of beauty, I register my thanks for having found thee, O isle of beauty. I ascend thy hills. Alone, I stand on thy mountaintop with the dome of interminable blue, above and the whole world beneath my feet. I look above. The eternal blue is flecked with fleeting sun-kissed clouds afloat in the blue. They are ships of gold in a sea of blue. I am an eagle up there. The king of the air endows me with his spirit. He dominates me with his sense of power and glorious freedom. I am the king of the air and the world beneath my feet is mine, all mine. I gaze upon my marvelous kingdom of Eden, my beautiful world of green pine and gray boulder, reaching down and away to the red cliffs and the blue sea, then away, far away, to the edge of the world where the sea ends and the sky begins. I see thy red cliffs like the prow of a great ship plowing the sea with a bone in her teeth, I see the habitations of men peeping out of the forests, houses and villages of men like me, who love the trees and the rocks and the sea. I hear a tone, a wondrous tone which comes from the sky, or the rocks, or the sea. Perhaps it comes from them all through the pines below, each pine a string of a giant harp which sings for me alone the epic of this wonderland. I hear the song with the ears of my soul as the humming, droning strings intone the wild, weird chant of this isle of the sea. Alone on the mountaintop of my world, I hear the small, still voice, the voice of God, creator of my world. And I know that he who made the marvelous world made me. Alone on the mountaintop, I hold communion with God and give thanks for this marvelous isle of peace, which is mine, all mine, for opening my eyes to see its wondrous beauty, and my ears to hear its music and its whisperings, and for attuning my soul that I might understand the language of thy pines and the pounding sea. I descend over crag and crevice and avalanche strewn rock. I find my way with winged feet. Into the scraggly forest I plunge and pause under the canopy of fir and pine which veils the sky. O scant forest of the mountaintop, O wind-blown stubble, fighting for life, I love thy staunchness, I love thy courage. 
Thy gnarled arms bear witness of thy struggle for existence on the bleak days when the wind howls and strips thee of thy unmatured seed cones. I love the bend in thy backs, silent evidence of thy burden, the north wind. Thy twisted roots, gone a-searching the scant soil for drink and finding none, courageously penetrating thy inhospitable mountain's rocky heart through deep and torturous crevasse, fills me with abject pity, and then amazement, and then glory, for the lesson of hope which symbolizes thy life is mine. My feet feel the softer tread of earth and mountain moss. I trip on scraggly roots, loose boulders balance on the chasm edges, and lean as though to leap. Sharp stones reach above the soil, cool spots of gray to cool the warm red pine-strewn earth. Huge crags, split and broken, each tell the tale of their one wild race from the mountaintop on a Pliocene day. Their one great tale, told to all who pause to hear as they pass that way. Potholes pit the rock and tell me of the forgotten torrents of another age, like pages of an open book. I read the hieroglyphics of the hills of Eden, ineffaceable markings carved in everlasting stone. Around me, tall trunks of the mountain gorge rise straight into the sky like pillars of a vast cathedral. This is the shadowy forest of the mountain slope, the sun-spotted fantastic shadow-streaked whispering forest of pine and spruce and fir and hemlock. These are the gummed and resined trunks this is the slippery, red-needled turf. This is a world of falling cones, where the odor of balsam makes one deliciously faint from overlong drafts of its health-giving breath. This is the refuge of the deer, the home of the wild. O forest of Eden, I love thee. I render thee my homage. My moistened eyes bear evidence of my silent adoration. The gentle touch of my palm on thy rigid trunks is token of my sympathy. Thou and I art kin. Thy God and mine are one. A spring of living water bubbles out of the rock and steals away in ripples and rills, singing a song of its own as it plays around pebbles and rocks down the mountainside as it seeks the sea. I follow its course. I find myself in a woodland path made by the feet of men like me, who love the brook and the wood, who love each fall from its source to the sea. Here is the home of the agile trout. Here is where the tongue of the wild slakes its thirst, hot from the sun. Here are deep pools, boulder lined with pebbly beds and quiet little bays which reflect the stars at night. Here is where skippers dart on placid pools, where minnows play and bullfrogs sit away the day. Here is where the bluebird learns its note from the song of falling waters, and where the shrill-voiced kingfisher watches for its prey from overhanging bough. This is the heart of the wood, where waters leap and plunge and sing of the sea, where rabbits run and foxes hunt where red squirrels scold and crickets chirp, and young fawns browse beside their ever-watchful dams. Slowly, I follow the beaten path made by those people of Eden, who, like me, understand the wonder music of the woodland, people who live below on the edge of the sea in unostentatious luxury. I love the step of the well-worn path. I love the feeling of yielding soil, I love to grip with my feet the roots of trees which go a-wandering across the path and give certainty to my step. I joyously leap from path to boulder, top and cross the stream at the foot of the hill, enticed by a beautiful tone of red against the blue of the hills, then a creamy white mass, and, O oh, elusive muse, my heart beats fast as my hesitant feet carry me through this wand-touched wonderwood. Emerging, I see a monument erected here at the foot of the hills in token of thy beauty. Rising from a dip in the green, this translucent pile stands white and red against the hills, 
immovable. O marvelous temple, in awesome silence I contemplate thy classic form. In ecstasy I absorb thy lines, thy mass, thy white and gold of the sun, thy red gold gleaming in the sun. Thou art purity, thou art purity. Thou art a virgin clad in robes of white, and the gleaming red gold is thine hair. Immortal pile, thou art the living, breathing spirit of Eden. Thou art the child of the hills, laid in the lap of the hills. Thou wert conceived by kin to me, who knew the hills, and the woods, and the sea. There is music in thy lines. Thy marvelous setting in the cradle of everlasting hills sings a symphony which holds me where I stand, spellbound, a prisoner of love beneath the wonder trees of this wonderland. The sun sinks low. The shade of Eden creeps slowly up thy walls, the Adante of thy symphony. Time is naught to me. Fantastic shadows of classic trees dance merrily in the sunlight of thy walls. My brain whirls as my heart beats to the merry tempo of thy symphony, the allegro vivace movement of thy symphony. The sky is aflame. The red sun dips in a cauldron of fire. The red no longer gleams. Slowly, slowly it melts in the violet of the hills, and thy white takes on the blue of the night as the stars appear one by one and hang in the trees to illuminate thee, to make perfect the night. Then slowly the last red rays are gone and fireflies swing their glowing lights against the trees and stars until I know not which are which, and much do both belong to the night. O thou white-robed spirit of Eden, temple of purity, thou eternal hills and girdling sea, thou people of Eden who are kin to me, I bid thee all good night. Thy symphony is played to its passionate end. I have heard its finale. A Soliloquy The spirit of the wanderer is upon me. Nature is calling for me to come to her, to come within her hidden depths. I have too long been far outside. I can no longer be so far outside. Desire to enfold myself within her rhythmic pulse beat is strong in me. Desire to hear her harmonies with my attuned soul, to know her silences, to see her with my inner eyes, to commune with her alone is irresistible. I can no longer withstand it. She commands my footsteps. Her power, her lure, compels my footsteps. The deep forest is before me. It draws me into it. My desire is to be drawn into it to be utterly lost within it, never to return until I am saturated with it, if such a thing could possibly be. A great white cloud hovers over the forest, beckoning, beckoning, promising to be my guide, if I but follow her. She seems a wayward guide, promising much, vaguely promising much, so temptingly. What matter? She has already given so much. Of that I am sure, for, having had it, I am enriched beyond all gifts which earth could give, for she is of the heavens, and her gifts are of the heavens. How exquisitely beautiful she is, her hair mouse gray, her loveliness all draped in billows of white. The high domes, reaching into the blue, cast great shadows of herself upon herself submerging the white of other winged clouds, graying them in her shadows like a jealous angel of the highest heavens playing hide-and-seek with the other winged angels of the high heavens. All for me, all of that glory, just for me. Her curved forms sing out against the interminable field of blue. Blue, the blue of immeasurable space which entombs the stars when clouds are silver like that and the sky is blue like that. Where leadest thou me, O angel of the high heavens? 
By which arched portal of my forest do I enter to find thee peering through? Or shall I lose thee for a while? I know a pine-leafed bed in the forest near a limpid azure pool. Perhaps I could find thee again under the waters of my beloved pool, instead of so far above me that I strain to see thee, my eyes being blinded by the glare of the sky, instead of being eased by the blue mirror of the pool, which softens thy glare when thou art upside down in the pool, and I looking deep down into thy heavens. There are two paths here, each leading into the deep forest. Which one will I take? What matter it which path I take? I see solitude. Solitude is seeking me, the solitude of forest's rhythmic silences which inner ears hear when there is naught but silence to hear. Each of the two paths lead to the solitude I seek. It matters not which path I take. My beloved pool is up this path. I am lured up this path for the quietude of my blue pool and the blue sky upside down in the pool and my white winged cloud upside down in the pool. Down the other path there is a barway. I love a barway. I love the taking down of one rail, the crawling through and putting the rail back again. I love the lure which draws me to the other side of it where there is something which is not here. There is a little river there, on the other side of that rail fence, which is not here. There are stones in the bed of the river, beneath its translucent waters, which I love to contemplate. The lure is strong, but I shall not yield to it. The quiet of the pool down this other path better suits my mood. Sometimes I love the singing of the waters on their stony bed, but today, I desire the silence from which songs of the waters spring. Why did I write those words, the silence from which songs of water spring? That thought was with me yesterday, and has ever since kept close to the surface of my thinking. Yesterday, I thought of the silence of space through which suns and earths flow in their orbits as the waters of rivers flow in their stony beds, singing their songs which spring from the silence and stillness of earth and the heavens of earth. From whence cometh the song of flowing waters? Is it the waters which sing? That could not be possible, for the waters of the calm pool do not sing. They are silent like my thoughts in meditation. Flowing waters sing. If still water does not sing, it must be the motion of the waters which sings and not the water. Thoughts like that bothered me yesterday, and come back to better now. It makes me wonder if there is any reality to sounds of things. Sound seems to be born from silence, for when sounds cease, silence still is. Yes, that must be so. The harp string is as silent when it is still, as the calm water of my pool is still. A hand plucks the harp string, and it sings. Why is that? What is the answer to that? The answer must be that the harp string never sings, that it is forever silent. It must be the motion of the harp string which sings, just as it must be the motion of waters which sings, for when motion ceases, sound ceases. Yes, that must be the answer. But where does motion go when it ceases, when waves which disturb the calm of my pool cease? There is still stillness, but where do the waves go? They must go into something. And where do the sounds go? They do disappear. Perhaps they just cease and do not go into anything. Perhaps motions and sounds are transient illusion, and stillness is the one permanent thing. Motion cannot become stillness. That is illogical. Perhaps both motion and sounds are not real at all. Perhaps only stillness is real the stillness of the universal equilibrium, the stillness of God's light. Yes, that must be so, for when I stop thinking and am within God's still light, I then know reality in knowing God. Yes, that is the answer, for
for when I am alone with God in the still light of his knowing, motion and sounds are non-existent. Even the roar of the mighty Niagara ceases when consciousness within me insulates the ecstasy of my knowing from earth's effects upon my senses. Even the sounds of a master symphony cease when their rhythms exalt me unto the highest heavens. For even though the sounds continue loudly, they cannot penetrate the stillness of the ecstatic light of God's kingdom within, which I have found his rest. I have always found that God's ecstasy voids the senses which consciousness awakens in the light of all knowing. I want to be alone with God. I must stop thinking and hearing and seeing. I want to forget my body, to leave it, to be freed from it, that I may again know the ecstasy of God's all-knowing light. From my bed of pine needles beside my pool, I look down through the waters into the upside-down sky to find my white cloud. It is not there. I am glad it is not there, for just the seeing of it would continue my seeing and hearing of earth things, when I wish to be alone with God in the center of all earth things, where stillness is, and I see naught and hear naught. What is it to me if birds sing, and winds of forests whisper, and torrents roar? I need not to hear or see them while I am in the light, for I know them. I created them. They have no reality, for the reality is in me. I imagined them, and they appeared, and they disappeared when I ceased to imagine them. They have their source in my knowing. I need not see them. When I imagine them, they then are, nor do they need to become. When I conceive them, they are then real, for they always are. But when I create them, they but simulate reality in form for but a little while and disappear. When I conceive my creations, I know them, but when I think my knowing into form to create the images of my thinking, I must then sense them. Thinking is motion, electric waves of motion. Thinking is the moving tension of mind's stillness as the lever is the moving extension of the fulcrum stillness. When I stop thinking, all the motion of earth things also stops. When I withdraw the extended lever of motion, which my thinking is, into its still fulcrum, I find God's stillness there. From body sensing, I am transported into the light of all knowing. When I thus find myself in the light of all knowing, I find within me the power which created the stars and made them move into their mighty orbits. When thus in the light, I am that power. From the interminable equilibrium of universal stillness, I returned to the universe of sensing the many things which move, things which make sounds while they move, things which have forms of the idea they manifest, forms which multiply themselves into many of a kind by repeating themselves in the mirrors of themselves. I found myself again thinking, again seeing the multiple effects of the one cause from which I have again been extended in form as but one of those multiple effects. I found myself again hearing the sounds which emanated from the stillness of God's universe of knowing. Oh, how beautiful is this moving universe of changing effects of multiple forms. How beautiful this ever-changing effect of an eternally unfinished picture painted by God from his unchanging concept. God is the master painter of the one universal masterpiece. The painting of nature is not the painter, however. There is no more reality to the picture painted by God with the pigments of his light spectrum and the brush strokes of electric waves than there is reality to the pictures I paint with spectrum pigments of earth and brush strokes of matter. When I conceive a picture, I know it. When I paint it, I think it into form and action. I sense what I know. But that which I sense into form is not the concept, nor is it I, its creator. I, who am but just now returned from the universe of knowing, now see clearly the things which bothered me yesterday while sensing the countless multiples of ever-moving forms which make sounds while they move 
and are silent when they simulate God's stillness. The day is waning, and the very human feeling of hunger commands my footsteps to take the path towards home. Reluctantly, I went my way out of the land of dreams and of reality to again give cognizance to that world of motion from which my body sprang to administer to its needs until another time when I again might be freed from its bindings of motion to again seek stillness where God awaits to commune with his own in his language of light which all men desire to know.